Okay, I farm in between the area between Fisher and Kirk's. which is affectionately known as the Fisher Triangle or the Sahara Desert of Minnesota. In the last 10 years, I've been in an extremely severe drought until this spring when we got 12 inches of rain in two weeks. So some of the conservation practices I was doing with uh, stripper headers, leaving high residue wheat and then coming back in and no-tilling into that, part of, it, part of it worked out great and part of it kind of backfired, which let me an opportunity to put in a cover crop. As you can see, it's about a 13 species cover crop mix that I ended up planting in the 2nd of July. And then, um, there. So here's, here's the rig I planted the field with. It was a 210 acre field that's as flat as this floor. Um, so I went in with 20 pounds to the acre of that cover crop mix, which was about 25 bucks an acre. And in three days time, I had seedling emergence. And this is a, is a week later from that. So that's seven, seven to eight days after planting. That's the cover I've got on that field. That's at seven and a half inch spacings. So this, is, this picture here shows uh, one month after emergence. So that cover crop grew extremely fast, especially all the brassicas in it. The sorghum was a little bit slower, but the brassicas and the clover, in this mix, I wouldn't recommend clover. Uh, the brassicas take over, shades the clover out, and the clovers just die. This is two weeks after emergence, or two months, excuse me. You can see the sorghum is starting to come on, and you can see the development of the tillage radishes. Um, and, and they grow really rapidly, too, and they build a heck of a canopy. There was no disease pressure. There was no insect pressure. Uh, in my small grains in the soybean fields, I had severe grasshopper pressure, but the cover crop had none. It didn't seem like the insects wanted it in it. And as far as deer predation in there, none. Uh, the deer did not like being in there. It was too thick. Um, they would get caught in it, and so the deer didn't want to go in there. So this is September 12th. Um, as you can see, the height of that sorghum, um, from about the 12th of August to the 12th of September, the sorghum grew almost six feet in that time frame. Uh, and that sorghum is, is extremely sweet. You'd snap it off and suck on it like a sugar beet, and it was extremely sweet as well, too. The seed wasn't viable, um, but the the, the tons of dry matter content, we took samples and dried it down and measured it in between what I had underneath the soil and above the soil was about nine and a half tons of dry matter content. When it, and then, as you'll see in the next picture here, look at the root proliferation of fibrous hair roots that are in there. What was really interesting is that was a dirt clod that was above the soil and the root penetration went up into it and penetrated that and basically shattered that whole clod. That was, that was one thing I found real. So after being shredded, um, I had tremendous amount of regrowth. And the thing that's really interesting is the last rainfall I had was July 9th. There was basically no rain from July 9th until mid-November in that area. So I was surprised to see that much regrowth come back on. And then the 7th of October, during beet harvest, we had a, a morning of about seven degrees and it melted that down. A week later, the, uh, later, the, uh, um, the, the, the uh, turnips and the radishes started rotting out they rotted out below soil surface level. And so three weeks ago, I was in, pulled soil samples again. And what's interesting is this field, I can make a mud ball from the surface down to two feet. All my other fields are pure dust. So only this cover crop field has retained moisture. My barley, my oats, my wheat, my wheat on wheat, winter wheat, there's very little moisture, but everything that was grown this year, there is absolutely Drain tiled fields that are being drain tiled around me right now, some, some pits that are at nine feet are as dry as a bag of flour. 
and another field is being drain tiled by me six miles away. They got drain pits at 19 feet, and it's as dry as a bag of flour. There's zero moisture. This is the only field that has moisture. Spring. Well, I don't have any fancy slides or anything like that and nice pictures and, and uh, whatever, but uh, I'm Drew Dragseth. Uh, I farm just 12 or 15 miles southwest of Crookston down Highway 75. Um, and we're split right on 75, so what they like to call the swamp of the Red Lake Valley. But uh, we have been doing cover crops and strip tilling and sugar beet strip tilling um, probably since 2013, and I've been on farm since 2011, um, working alongside my dad. And uh, one big part of what we've been pushing is strip tilling for sugar beets. and. Uh, making sure that sugar beets are working for us and uh, we're not working against sugar beets. Um, they steal so much from the ground and, and we, we uh, like to bring them to big piles and put them there and, and think we're getting a whole lot back in money-wise, but we don't get any nutrients back. Uh, so cover crops working in sugar beets is a big thing. Uh, we have uh, row crop spreaders that we put down or have been putting down rye uh, right before the harvest of sugar beets so that uh, we don't have any growth into the planter or into the lifter and causing problems that way. But we have the uh, early growth of rye and, and or winter cover crops going into the next spring and hopefully breaking up some of that uh, destruction of sugar beets coming out of the ground. Uh, we've also been working with a local rancher to uh, have cattle on fall uh, grown cover crops and or uh, early summer grown cover crops and and moving forward uh, with what Jody and, and uh, them have been doing we had been asked to be part of that trial uh, and just with the way the spring was I had seen the exact opposite effect in rye is it was so wet that the rye almost looked like a swamp out there it was wa standing water and the rye was growing through and it was already May 25th, 26th, and moving forward, we just could not get into the to the rye to plant those soybeans, so we ended up missing out on that trial. Uh, we had some strip-tilled rows into that uh, rye as well to try and plant uh, soybeans into that, and just again, too wet, and yet I was able to then harvest that rye come fall with, with no applied fertilizer or anything, and, and we ended up achieving 65 bushel average on and no weed pressure in terms of across the rye just with iliopathic effect and and such and moving forward with the sugar beet wise is a big focus for us just with with being in the Red River Valley is such a push for sugar beets and and so making them work for us and and not against us is is a big part there too um, so that's just a over cap or over review of what we've been doing anyways we started experimenting with cover crops about 12 years ago. Started with USDA and San SP. First year we well and uh, seeded a blend of cereal rye, winter peas, radishes, and turnips. And I'd say our first year was pretty much a failure. And I, it took me a while to get. Uh, Little by little, we find things that work, and we find more things that don't work. And every year is different. We've seeded with a single disc drill. We've broadcasted with an airplane and with a floater. And then stuff we float on, we work in with a high-speed disc. Uh, we've had varying success. Uh, the, the influences are fall weather, seeding date. I would say after September 1st, at our latitude, is pretty much a Allelopathy with the preceding crop is an issue for us, and insects. We've, we were having trouble getting our uh, brassicas to survive, and we couldn't figure out why. They came up nice, but they just slowly but surely disappeared. Dave Grafstrom with the university was doing a plot in one of our fields this fall, and he discovered that the flea beetles were eating all the brassicas. I had never checked for that, but it was amazing how many there were. Just basically terminate the brassica as soon as it comes up. We use a five-year crop rotation, uh, spring wheat, 
followed by perennial ryegrass, then canola, then corn or hybrid cereal rye, and then soybean. So we try to find cover crops that we can plant either in or behind those crops. We're still learning. We've not figured out how to make cover crops consistently successful. In uh, perennial ryegrass, we see the mixture. Best luck is pro-tilling the sod immediately after harvest, which is early August, and then floating the seed on and pro-tilling again. If we seed uh, directly into the sod, the just doesn't seem to come. Some years, if it rains a lot, the ryegrass grows and chokes all the cover crop out. And if we get just a rain to germinate, that seems to work the best. Our corn stalks, we don't till at all in the fall. If we, if we try to have a program with tillage in corn stalks, we end up forcing the harvest always and drying 25% corn. So I try to avoid that. We just, we plan to never till our corn stalks. We, we fly cereal rye on uh, in early July, just at or before tasseling. And we're really happy with, that's probably our biggest success is cereal rye and corn. Because the next spring, the, the soil is just as mellow as a flower bin. Where we have cereal rye, and if we have untilled corn stalks with no cover crop, it's always sour and lumpy. Uh, fly oats into our soybeans in mid-August and that depending on the year there's a variable amount of growth on the oats in uh, one year in 2019 when it was a really wet harvest the oats saved us because it uh, grew up about six inches tall and the plastic on the soybean headers just that oats lubricated it and we didn't have any trouble with mud sticking underneath and otherwise it was a problem. I don't have uh, much experience with uh, flax or vetch or clover. We've tried them, but we haven't gotten them, we haven't figured out how to make them do well. We don't do any fall tillage with the exception of the ryegrass sod. The rest of it, we leave everything till the spring. Seed, seed cost and application has been about $20 an acre, but uh, this year, of course, it was a lot more. CSP has been helping defray the cost, but we're out of that now for a couple of years, so we're, we're standing all the cost ourselves. Yes, my goal is just to try and make the, for soil health, to make the farm more productive. The idea of... Uh, Having something living on the soil as much of the year as possible resonates for me. I won't ever be able to do all the research to f prove it, but it it makes sense. So I'm I'm going with that plan for now, anyway. Great, thank you. Um, you answered all the questions I had them written there. Like, what do you do for tillage? And you just answered it. So, um, do we have some questions from the audience? Todd, uh, since you've been doing cover crops now for 12 or so years, um, do you see a difference in your um, fertility program or your, your nitrogen? Um, are you in some kind of a balance between uh, the amount of nutrients that the cover crop takes up versus what is being released by sort of the old cover crop that's decomposing? No. I, I mean, so we test every field every year. And I would say that I have not seen a, any significant changes in uh, background fertil fertility levels in any of the field. Answer your question. So why um, do you want to have cover crops out there? You're not seeing a nutrient bump and badgers keep interrupting it. <laughs> um, what, what benefits are you seeing with them? 
So man, the, the two really obvious ones that, that I talked about were the harvestability of the soybeans in a wet harvest and uh, corn stalks to me is a no-brainer to put uh, rye on, on the corn just because the field is so nice and mellow in the spring. The other things, uh, so I read all the farm press and everyone's pushing soil health. Like I said, I'm not going to ever do all the research that would prove it out on my farm, but it makes sense to me. And some other things that I get to see that I think are environmentally sound, even though I wouldn't, they're just anecdotal, would be the deer in the fall and the canola fields. I don't till my canola stubble. And any canola plant that you miss, the birds just love that in the winter. They're there. I mean, they find it all. So that it has effects that I wouldn't be necessarily add to my bottom line, but I think they, they're beneficial to, to the life around me. Good answer. For me, it, it, with it being such a, I'm in such a continuous dry portion, so I'm using the cover crops as a shading and weed control barrier, but it's also to, to augment my, my tillage with using the radishes and the turnips and some of the root species to do some of that tillage versus me doing it mechanically. So I'm saving the fuel cost and the equipment repairs and everything like that. And my my soils shrink swell dramatically, and and so um, that's that's in a benefit as well too. But what I'm seeing so far this year with my cover crops is retaining or building soil. Now I can come in there and and just what I'm planning on doing is going straight in there with a no-till drill and seeding my soybeans right in there. And that by that way, I can mitigate the nitrogen tie-up from that heavy organic matter mass, but now it's built some soil porosity back and give me some bulk density to that tight, tight, tight clay soil. My topsoil, black topsoil, is only six inches deep, and then I go into the most god-awful yellow sticky clay when it's not powder dry. So I'm, I'm trying to use it as as wind and water erosion enhancement, but bulk density enhancement stuff. But one of the, I heard one of the comments, one of the guys was saying he's looking at slug issue in, in his fields. Well, there's a product called Ferox, and that's a slug bait that works really, really well to take. It's a granule, and you apply it in the spring. For me, it all comes down to what really is making the farmer money. I mean... We like to think that we drive our trucks to the elevator and sell our grain or sell sugar beets at the factories and, and think that's where we're making all our money. But we tend to neglect sometimes just the fact that our banks are the soil. I mean, we're all working or renting land that otherwise we own it. I mean, this is high price land that we just seem to neglect all the time because we're just bringing the bushels into the elevator and making a check. For me, it's, it's taking care of what's actually making us money. And, and if we didn't have the soils and didn't have that topsoil, we won't be farming. I mean, none of us will be farming in 10, 15 years if we, if we continue to neglect what is truly allowing us to make our money. And, and it's such an abundant resource that if we just simply do s small little steps to go back in time, I mean, it's, it's not going to get any better if we keep going the way we are. And, and I... <laughs> I know for a fact, my grandpa likes to say, well, we've been farming that way for 20 years. Well, what's to say we need to keep farming that way for another 20 years? We won't be. I mean, I, it's such a, such a paradigm of, <laughs> well, we can keep doing it because it's working, but when does it stop working? And even driving out in the fields now is where the badger holes are. I, I mean, I was driving out there with the, with the ranger side by side and, and just... The, the snow on my stubble field was about six to seven inches deep compared to the next field right no more than 50 feet to the north, which had maybe an inch and a half to an inch of snow on it. And as soon as I was driving through my field, I could, I could scrape off the top layer of snow and I could see black dirt on top of six or seven inches of snow and thought to myself, well, I, I know it's not blowing from my field, so where is it blowing from? And, and all that little bit of erosion can be a huge difference in, in maybe not now, but 
10, 15 years, you'll notice a big difference. So cover crops in that sense is, is a big part for why I, I don't like seeing black ditches in the spring and I don't like seeing black snow anytime. So if, if I can keep my, my dirt on my field, it, it uh, is a big help to what I'm growing. So. And if you have farmers who do conventional till around you, you get their soil. Yeah, and, and, and build soil. we like to always complain about high input costs. Well, every little bit of soil that goes off your field is is just more money that's coming out of your pocket. So it's it's just a big bank problem that we, we tend to neglect sometimes just because we get to have sit around in the winter and, and work on equipment or get big checks in the fall. You know, it's it's easy to forget about the soil when it's covered in, in snow, but all those little black tops sticking out erode with the tiny little particles of, of frozen water. So it's, it's a big loss if you think about it over the course of 10 years or 15 years. And I, I definitely want to be farming in 10 years. So I want to keep doing what I'm doing to try and help my soils and, and or others. So. Yeah. Okay. I have a question about the sugar beets. You plant prior to sugar beet harvest with a, some sort of strip till machine? So what we've been looking forward to doing is uh, because we plant on 22 inch rows on, on 24 rows is we have a row crop spinner spreader. So row crop tires, unlike the fat tires um, and, and they make fat tire and, and row crop tires, but uh, we just simply spinner spread on. And then with the lifter going through is it works up so much ground itself that it's pretty much a tillage pass in itself. So in turn is working in that uh, cover crop seed in, in between the rows. And then what we do is it ends up making kind of a plateau almost on, in between where the sugar beets would have been. Uh, just in terms of cutting with the lifter wheels is we then can plant uh, soybeans directly on top of those, on top of those plateaus with cover crops right in between in those rows. Um, and it keeps it off of those plateaus, uh, and then we just uh, terminate in the spring. But uh, in terms of fall uh, spreading of cover crops is we are able to spread over the tops of the beets, and granted it, it does cover, or the, the seed falls off to either side of the sugar beet with how big the leaves are, but with the working of the beet lifter then, it, it allows the working in of, of any unplanted uh, seed. So you don't do any other tillage in the fall after harvest then? No. Um, and, and with that being said is we try and do soy or have been trying to do soybeans after beets just in terms of fertility issues um, with other plants where you would then need to have a, another working pass. Uh, just how rough the sugar beets or, or the, uh, I guess, harvest of sugar beets makes the field is you'd need a chisel plow pass or, or even a, a heavy cultivator pass to really knock down those ridges. Uh, whereas if you can get a cover crop that maybe can uh, do some own tillage, uh, that really helps. We've also found with sugar beets that if you um, put on the cover crop seed and then you can't get in there to lift until the cover crop seed germinated, you lose it. As soon as you go through and lift, you'll, it will kill it. Um, so it needs to be within a day or two of when you're lifting. The same way with edible beans, uh, if you're knifing edibles, is, is, is like the week before you're going to start knifing, is to blow that cover crop on and then come back in and you're knifing the bean, incorporating that seed. And then you've got an established cover crop right away in the fall so that those fields aren't blowing all winter. And same with early pre-pile on, on sugar beet harvest. If you're harvesting beets in, in August, is to plant those rows that you've got dug and then at least that way, if you've got physical wind breaks across that field, it helps that low-level ground sifting. Other questions? Show of hands, how many guys are using cover crops right now? Deal. How many of you are thinking about it? Okay, <laughs> thank you. Okay, Missy, any? I got a question for you guys. Um, fertilizer, do you run into trouble getting your fertilizer on? And maybe, Drew, you can uh, 
I know I get a lot of questions about how to do strip till and still get your fertilizer on. Um, but even with, you know, Craig and Todd too, do you guys run into problems trying to get fertilizer on or have you found workarounds or you just apply it normally? So for us, it's been, our air seeder gets a lot of work in the fall. Um, probably three times that of in the spring. And I'd much rather run a no-till air seeder over the ground than a cultivator or even a chisel plow, which this this fall, um, not naming any names, but in terms of just fall work, it was just me and my brother. And we cover right around 3,500 acres. And, and we were able to get all of our fertilizer needs put down this fall. Um, granted, it was a dry fall. And so, I mean, it makes it a lot easier when you run till November, but uh, just in terms of comparison wise for fuel cost and, and whatnot is I, I know for a fact between us and another farm is and comparable acres right around the same 3,500. We spent right around $7,000 on fuel total for fall work after harvest. And they, I estimate right around 3,800 or $38,000 on fuel cost alone um, just in the fall in terms of working wise. Uh, and that was just because we live such close proximity and I know all their fields as I can see that they would spread on chisel plow, spread on chisel plow, spread on knife in anhydrous. And in the spring, it's all going to be the same. I mean, our fields, I mean, if we see a two bushel difference in terms of any crop, I'm going to take that $30,000 and put it in the bank and say, two bushels, what does it really matter in the long term of profit per acre over bushels per acre. Um, but with the strip tiller is we're able to put down fertilizer right with the strip tiller. Um, and depending on the strip tiller you have, it's either an easy job or a hard job. And, and uh, but with us, we finally have been able to figure out how to get it right down for sugar. And we've been strip tilling sugar beets and, and uh, uh, soybeans for eight, eight, nine years now. And it's been a real trial and error process in terms of just wet falls and wet springs and, and whatnot. So being able to put down fertilizer for the sugar beets in the spring with the strip tiller is, is a huge help. And, and so we usually air seed down a cover crop and then strip till right into that before it has uh, been established. And that allows for a spring, a nice clean strip in the spring. Uh, with fertilizer put right down in that row and, and then you plant right into that row. So it's also cut down on our fertilizer cost tremendously as we're able to cut uh, anywhere from 25 to 50% of our fertilizer uh, across the field. And, and you never know with losses in terms of chisel plowing and spread on fertilizer or, or whatnot. So that's been a nice, nice thing is being able to know we're putting fertilizer right where we want it to be. Thank you. Well, I'll let you guys finish, but just thank you for volunteering that information. I know we talk about, oh, with, you know, reducing tillage saves fuel, but I never heard numbers like that. So $30,000, that's a big, for a comparable farm operation, that's a big deal. Yeah, and in, for like, for me on, on nitrogen side applications, I got several ways of getting on after the crop is planted. I can use stream bars and stream bar on UAN, and or I can get... Um, Agritain coated urea and spread that on and get the rains and stuff like that. Um, some of the equipment changes I'm looking at is is I use a box drill, but be looking at changing up to something more like an 1895 with mid row banders and still be able to go through that heavy crop residue uh, and put starter down at that at the same time. So not looking at broadcasting. Uh, I want to be placing everything. The efficiency of placement saves you a lot of money over broad. We have strictly spring fertilizer applications and some in-crop fertilizer application. We don't do any fall. We uh, BRT everything and uh, some is floated on and tilled in and some is, wheat is all in row or mid row, so cover crops don't have an effect on our. Oh, there's a question over here. All right, I know we're running time, but we'll take just a few more questions if you guys have them. 
On the sugar beets, are they variable rate fertilized or not with your strip till uh, for, the, for either of you beet growers? So for us, it would be nice. Uh, this is actually the third year now that we've gotten the fertilizer working directly on our strip tiller. Uh, and it's just a program that I've been trying to figure out for variable rate um, in terms of obviously being able to really put your money where you want it to be. Uh, but in terms of variable rate, we have not got that working just yet. I'd love to be within the next two years, have that working and have variable rate maps working to put it right where we want it to be. Uh, before that, we were with the air seeder putting down fertilizer in a variable rate, uh, which was a much easier system that we had running for, for years. So yes, before the strip tiller was directly putting down fertilizer, we were able to variable rate with the air seeder. I don't have beets, but the same thing is we're, is the change up in equipment is going to be a necessity to start handling some of these products and programs that you want to do. Some of the current equipment that we're using just doesn't, doesn't apply or doesn't allow you to do the things you need to do when you want to do it for interseeding or double cropping or something like that because you're doing too much soil disturbance. And I'm trying to eliminate as much soil disturbance as I possibly can. And some, a lot of the equipment that we have in the United States just is not built to handle this, whereas in Europe they've, they're doing tremendous amount of work under very, very heavy covers in very clay, wet soils, especially up in through England and up through Scotland and in those areas. They've really started to master both the equipment manufacturing and how to handle these cover crops. I want to thank you very much for being up here and, and showing us what you're doing. And you're here for lunch if anybody has more questions. Okay, let's give them a big hand.